Mike Costello, and I'm here with Dr. Iris Freelander, and today we're going to talk about the reality of divine order. In our lives, so often, we believe that there's chaos and confusion and difficulty, but one of the things that we knew, know in New Thought metaphysical philosophy is that there is divine order in the midst of every circumstance and situation. That means that beyond what we see and hear with our human eyes and human ears, there is a universal divine order that permeates all that is, despite the appearances of life. We know that Christ Jesus himself invited people to see beyond the appearances of this world. And we believe that in this day and in every age, we are called to see beyond what we see with our human eyes and human ears. And regardless of what our religious background is, what our faith tradition is, what church we attend, the philosophy that we are talking about is universal, it is non-judgmental, and it is totally tolerant of all traditions and all faiths. And so divine order is really a reality, regardless of what we believe, isn't it, Iris? Yes, it is. And it's all it's in our minds whether or not there is divine order, because we can create chaos or we can be attuned to divinity and then flow with the divine order that surround us. And those persons who are serene, and we know people, that people say, oh, that person is so serene. Oh, if they are, then they are attuned to divinity, and they're in step with divine order, and they don't try and force their own thoughts or their own um, way of thinking or being on the world in general. Isn't that true? That's true. And they also don't even necessarily try to change yes. the negative things that happen in their life. Yes. Instead, they're simply able to cope and deal with them. Yes. And they're also people who have tremendous vitality, who are tremendously creative, and usually they're people who are happy all of the yes. time, regardless <laughs> of circumstance and situation. And so for many people, uh, and of course our our fellowship and, and our group is, is filled with people that are just like the ones that we've described because we believe in this reality and we believe in the fact that, as we say so often in, in New Thought Metaphysics, that we live in our minds. And so as we live in our minds, we can either choose to see divine order despite the appearance, or we can see what we believe we see with our human eyes. Another example of claiming divine order has to do with people that are facing uh, financial challenges, prosperity. Mm -hmm. and that is to see prosperity in the form of divine order, even in the face of lack or limit. Mm -hmm. And so even though maybe our resources are more limited than we would choose to have them, we see beyond the fact that the checkbook is empty right now, and we see to the fact, we see beyond that to the fact that that checkbook can have the resources that it needs to meet our obligations, those of our families and those around us. But it, the real uh, strategy and the real importance of this teaching is that we do something about it. <laughs> that we don't simply philosophize and we don't simply intellectualize, but we take these principles and we apply them to our lives and then we get up and we do something. We take responsibility for ourselves. And one of the things that we talk about so often in prosperity is that many times we think the bills are horrible. You know, none of us like to look at the mailbox and see a stack of bills and then look at our checkbook and have our limited resources. But the fact is that those things are all blessings because if we have bills, we have something for those bills. If we have bills for a house payment for either rent or for our mortgage, we have a home. If we have a bill for the electric company, we have lights. If we have, uh, if we have money that we need to spend on food, we're able to feed ourselves. And many people don't have that luxury of those negatives that we see when in fact they're positives. But we need to be able to see beyond the appearance of the circumstance and to see the reality of it. And I think that's tremendously important for people to claim divine order, especially in the midst of turmoil. And that's the hardest. The hardest challenge is to see divine order in the midst of turmoil, but it's the one that can bring us the greatest peace and the greatest joy. And some people term it going with the flow. If we go with the flow, then we are attuning ourselves to divinity, and we're not taking respons we're, we're taking responsibility for our own thoughts and our own actions, but we're not letting the world rest on our shoulders. We're just taking responsibility for our own area and not trying to uh, say what ha should happen here or should happen there or ought to happen, but we just take the responsibility for our own area. And when people relax and flow with that energy, then they are more serene, aren't they? Then they're more apt to 
uh, flow with divine order. They are, absolutely. Last Sunday in church, we were talking about a lady who had a terrible situation in her life. Her husband died. She was too young to get Social Security. They had no uh, savings to speak of. They had a mortgage, not a tremendous mortgage, but the mortgage had to be paid nonetheless if she was to stay in her home. And here she was uh, in her late 50s, never having worked, uh, in a horribly disastrous situation. And she went through an agonizing period. But then in the midst of that agonizing period, she came to understand the teaching that we're talking about. And that teaching has to do with seeing divine order. It has to do with being aware of the way that her mind operated. And she decided, I have to do something. And she and she was a spiritual and religious person. And many people would say, well, I'm waiting for God to do it. Well, <laughs> God isn't going to do it. And it's not for us to expect God to do it. And I think we do a great disservice us when we expect that. Instead, what we do expect is that infinite intelligence, that God, that the divine will guide us and direct us. And indeed they did in the case of this, this lady. Mm -hmm. And she decided she needed to get herself educated. She needed to get herself a job. She needed to change her opinion of life and to become positive and affirmative again. And she needed to pull up her shoe, shoe strap or bootstraps and get about the business of improving her life and her situation. And part of that, a great part of it, has to do with the difference that we talk about so often in, in the church about the not giving up but giving in. Yeah. And there's a real difference because when we give up, we kind of wring our hands and say, ain't it awful? And we stay there. But when we give in, we say, all right, this is what's happened. This is where I am. Now what do I do? That's exactly what happened to this lady. This is where she was. Her husband was dead. She had no money. And she was in a very difficult part and uh, a point in her life. And yet she decided, my husband is dead. And that's, that's a done deal. And I have to go to work. And she began methodically and systematically to deal with the circumstance and situation. She gave in to it. Mm -hmm. And she gave in to it. She took responsibility for it. And she turned her life around. So that six months later, she had a job. She didn't have a lot of money, but she had her home. And she was relatively happy when six months before she believed that the world was over. And we all know people who have gone to bed at that point in time. You know and I know we in our counseling ministry and in the church we <coughs> know a lot of people who have gotten into bad situations in their life and they simply stay there and they Give never on. come out. It's unfortunate and it's awful, but that's what they've chosen to do. And we can support them, we can help them, we can do all that we can, but then we have to let them learn the lesson that they need to learn. And so often they need to learn it from the very, very bottom. And luckily this lady uh, was able to deal with that circumstance and situation beautifully and magnificently. Another example that you know very well is uh, the, our friend in the church last year who passed away with cancer and had a horrible disease mm -hmm. and had a difficult six months. And yet she was able to overcome that disease, not in getting cured. And we have people who have been cured, but she wasn't cured. But her mind was miraculously touched and her life was transformed so that those last six months were just great and her death was wonderful, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And she gave credit to the church and the people of the church who helped sustain her. But overall, those two ladies that you just defined were accepting the sustaining power of God and then not giving up, but giving in to the circumstances around them and then taking responsibility. And in the case of the lady from our church who died, uh, she said, I wasn't healed but I was he in physically, but I was healed in spirit. And she was indeed healed in spirit. You could see it in her face and her tone of voice and in the joyousness she exuded the rest of her life, that last six months of her life. When the first, when she first heard about her illness, it was so, her mind was so chaotic. It took her a bit of time to come to terms, but she came to terms really rather quickly, didn't she? She came to terms quickly. Uh, the first month or two was horrible for her. Yeah. She was depressed, she cried, she was in anguish, and she had a horrible time. Then she gave in. Yeah. And she took responsibility for where she was. Yeah. And she did come faithfully for prayer, and we believe in prayer, and we've had some wonderful healings. But mm -hmm. the healing that really is important is what happens inside us. And just as you said, she was healed because early on in that six-month process, probably about the third or fourth month, she had decided, and in one of the conversations that we had, she said, I'm not going to let this cancer touch me. Mm -hmm. And so it touched her body. 
yeah. and her body deteriorated and deteriorated rather rapidly. But the interesting thing was that the last three months of her life, she was relatively pain-free. Yeah. She was happy. She was uh, empowered. And when she made that last few days with a, a patient that had extensive cancer, she was able to make that transition in an almost effortless and close to painless way, which is really magnificent. It has to do with the fact that she saw divine order in the midst of that circumstance and situation. And we can point to others who have been healed and had wonderful healings. You had someone in your Wednesday night service that had a, a miraculous uh, healing, physical healing. Physical healing. But, and that person too didn't allow the sickness to touch them. And in their case, the physical uh, healing transpired. But whether we're healed physically or not, doesn't have anything to do with anything, really. Yeah. It has to do with how we feel about it. It has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with our faith. It has nothing to, it has everything to do with the responsibility that we take for our lives as human beings and as spiritual beings, and whether or not we claim divine order in the midst of the most terrible times. Mm -hmm. And um, back to that lady who came to our church, who was part of our church service, she used to come on Sunday and Wednesday evening, Sunday morning and Wednesday evening, uh, for healing, but she said, I'm being healed in my spirit. Mm -hmm. I'm being healed on the, she wasn't coming for a physical healing because she knew she wouldn't get it, but she was sustained through the healing that she did receive because she was receiving the sustaining healing power of God and she couldn't do it herself at home alone or in the, in the home that she stayed in. But she knew that she needed the church around her. And that's an important aspect, to know what we need, how we can receive it. Because some people can stay home all the time and receive whatever it is they need, where others need the, the, the group energy around them. Many people need support. Yes. And, and of course, our, the founder of our fellowship in 1927, Dr. Garlish, said the only purpose of a church is fellowship. It has <laughs> nothing to do with spiritual, anything uh, mystical or magical. It has to do with fellowship. It has mm -hmm. to do with bringing a body of people together of common belief who are going to support and nurture one another. Mm -hmm. And that's all. Mm -hmm. And God is no more present in the church than he is on the street. <laughs> so we can get over that right away. But the fact is that when we surround ourselves with people of like consciousness, of like thinking, and one of the things that we believe so much in our faith tradition, because we know that the power of the mind has such a dynamic force in both mind, body, and spirit, that when we're able to improve our way of thinking, when we're able to improve the way that we feel about circumstances and situations, our mind, our body, and our spirit's touched, and mm -hmm. we're able to deal with whatever happens. And that has to do with seeing through the experience seeing beyond the experience and claiming divine order and not just giving up then or and not giving up and folding our hands mm -hmm. and saying, isn't it great? I'm such a faithful person and God <laughs> loves me better than anybody else, which is a whole problem unto itself. Instead, we're saying that we are claiming divine order that we're claiming the reality that we are children of God and that we have limitless resources. Now, I don't know what will happen to us, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what happens to us, but what happens in us mm -hmm. is what's important. Yes, and how, how we receive that divine energy and then send it out again is the important aspect, isn't it? Tremendously, tremendously important. During this program, uh, Dr. Freelander and I have been sharing with you some ideas about divine order and living in our awareness and in our minds. And we'd like to pause at this point in the program and allow you to receive some information in your homes to continue your understanding of this teaching. We would like to give you the opportunity to explore and discover in your own home the new thought teachings that this program is sharing with you by sending you a free copy of one of these booklets. Simply address your request to Confident Living at P.O. Box 7726, Long Beach, California, 90807. Whatever your dream, whatever your vision, you can reach it through confident living. Divine order is what we're talking about today. And uh, in this uh, second half of the program, I think we should kind of shift from divine order in our personal lives, although that's important, we want to come back to it, but to the fact that there's divine order in this world, isn't there? Yes. And so often we believe and we've been taught, and of course Western uh, faith traditions often talk about the fact that this is, a, is an evil and terrible world. 
Well, we take uh, issue with that, and we believe that there is sound uh, scriptural and, and religious and spiritual uh, foundations of faith to substantiate the fact that this is a good and nurturing world if we can see the reality of divine order in our world despite appearances. Yes, and we, we live in a physical reality, but we also live in a spiritual reality. And when we can bring the spiritual and the physical together and function from that level, then we're able to live with divine order in our hearts and then send it out into the world and see that aspect of being in the world as divine order is manifested throughout the earth. D divine order is a dynamic of spiritual reality. There is no questioning that. God created all that is and it is good. Therefore, everything that is not good is created in, at another level of consciousness or existence that is separate and apart from God. And so it's a little bit like a smoke screen. And so we see the world and we say, oh my goodness, things are really bad and they're getting worse. <laughs> well, in fact, things are really good and they're getting better. But there are a variety of things taking place on the surface, just like in our lives. There are a variety of things taking place in every one of our lives that are bringing us the lessons that we need to learn, that are teaching us the things that we need to come to know, that are strengthening us and empowering us and bringing us everything that we need. And it's the same in this world. The world is where it needs to be at this point in time for the benefit of all of us who are on planet Earth. But the reality is that this is a good world created by a good God and populated by good people. <laughs> the fact is that we misbehave, and we misbehave for a variety of reasons, and we could go into that in another program. But the fact is that just because we misbehave or just because the world appears to be in turmoil doesn't mean that it is really in turmoil. One of the foundresses of one of the great faiths of New Thought is Mary Baker Eddy, who founded Christian Science. And Mary Baker Eddy taught very appropriately this teaching of the non-reality of matter. And I don't want to get too deeply into that. And a lot of other metaphysical teachers of the last century and this century have taught the same in metaphysical new thought philosophy. And what that law says simply is that the life, the world that we see, the physical world, is not real. The real world is the spiritual world. That's the presence of God. That's, that's the divinity of God and us as, hum, as spiritual beings or souls, if you will, as spirit beings. But we are in this physical experience and we are in the physical experience of this world, which is actually not real, <coughs> but we believe it's real because we see it with our eyes and we hear it with our ears. But it's not real. It is a transient process through which we are moving to learn lessons, to come to know what we need to know. And so, in, in a sense, the physical world is not real. Now, we believe so often that the spiritual world maybe isn't real <laughs> because we can't see it. Well, in fact, the opposite is true. And a great example of that is just to look in the mirror. And if there's one thing that God's trying to teach us is that matter is not constant and is not real because we are constantly changing and we are changing to the point of disappearing from a physical stand, from the physical standpoint. And so this non-reality of matter is tremendously important for us to understand. And that's not to say that this chair isn't real. The chair is real and is serving a great purpose for me right now because I'm able to enjoy it and sit on it. But the other thing that we know, and we know from a scientific fact, is that this chair is not solid at all. It's actually energy that is moving all, and, and that this, this constant movement or energy is creating the real, reality of matter, and it appears to be a chair. When this chair ceases to exist, it will become something else. And so the non-reality of matter is tremendously important for us to understand that the physical world is not the real world. It is real for us while we're in this physical experience, but the real world for us and the reality is spiritual, and the real world is in perfect divine order. And our lives are in perfect divine order, despite what we believe by the appearances of them. Yes, and one thing that makes us um, get out of sync is fearfulness of change. When we're fearful of change, then we, we're totally uh, not in tune with divine order. So if we can just drop that aspect, it would be very helpful. All aspects of fear. And yeah. what we say about fear is fear is false evidence appearing real. Fear is, is non-existent. It's not reality. <laughs> false evidence appearing real. And it is in our minds. And one of the great disservices that we do in organized religion and in spirituality so, so often is we create fear 
in the minds of people in their relationship with God. Yeah. And in fact, there's nothing to fear. Yeah. And we create all kinds of ideas and dogmas and creeds so that we can create a God of fear and we can become fearful in that experience. But we know in fear, we've stepped out of divine order, haven't we? Yes. And if we step into divine order in the midst of any circumstance or situation, then we can claim peace and we can claim uh, happiness, we can claim joy, and we can claim empowerment. Yes, and then we're more serene and happy and productive, and we're able to, and productive doesn't have to be getting a lot of things done in the world, but just getting things accomplished in our own right, in our own minds, and keeping order in our own sphere of existence. The great exemplifier that we know so well in, in Christian tradition is Christ Jesus, and the, the great way shower of positive thinking, of affirmative thought. And one of the things that we see in his life is that he was in the midst of divine order during all of his 33 years, in every circumstance from Bethlehem to Calvary and everything in between. Lots of things happened to him. A lot of bad things happened to him. And in the midst of all of those bad things, he was serene. Mm -hmm. He was centered. He mm -hmm. was at peace mm -hmm. because he claimed divine order in the midst of every circumstance and situation. And of course, the great message that he gave us is that the things that he did, what he we could do and more. more. And so if he did that, we can do it. And we don't even need to be Christians in order to claim that. That's, that's just a universal reality. And he was teaching us universal principles of faith and spirituality. Mm -hmm. And he was teaching the reality of divine order in the midst of every circumstance and situation. The world of his day was horrific. His life wasn't great. And yet he claimed divine order in the midst of all of it and saw beyond the appearance into the good. Yeah. And he was able to claim the good. And because of that, he was never defeated or overcome by the circumstance and situation. And he, he exemplified our divine birthright, his divine birthright, and showed us that that is our right. And his, his example in all aspects of being is so powerful. But when we look at the serenity with which he viewed his last week of life, then we know that if we can live in divine order, we can face whatever life brings, whatever challenge life might bring. And uh, those people who live successfully and die successfully and happily are those who do just that, aren't they? Absolutely. And that transcends all faith traditions. Yes. We remember Gandhi. Exactly. Uh, Gandhi, a tremendous example. And we have to get over this exclusivity yes. idea that only we or only of this faith are the people that are chosen. And, all. Mm -hmm. and in fact, Divine order is a spiritual and a material reality that can be claimed by anyone of any faith at any time. And it has to do with the way that our minds operate and the way that we think and what we choose to claim. Yes, and uh, Jesus was for all people. And uh, Gandhi had one picture in his hut, and that was a picture of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Isn't that nice to know? Interesting quote that I like of Gandhi says he, in his comment about Christianity was, why are you Christians so unlike your Christ? <laughs> and I think that's a great, uh, a great reminder. statement and a reminder, reminder. And of the fact that there is universal truth. And, yeah. and I think this issue of tolerance and understanding and mutual respect and, and the joy of diversity are wonderful things that are coming into our lives right now. So many people tell me all the time, you hear it, I hear it, we all do about how bad things are. And in fact, things are so wonderful <laughs> because we are really forced to confront the issues of our faith. We are, are, are required and called to confront the untruths uh, that we've been taught. And we are called to learn something that we have known from the beginning. And that is that we are all the same, that we are more alike than we are different, and that if we choose, we can have divine order and peace and harmony and balance in the midst of every circumstance and situation, and it's only a thought away. It's yes. only one thought away. <laughs> divine order begins in our sphere within our own mind, as you just said. Everything begins within us. Yes. And so often we look at the larger picture. We want to talk about the world or our family or our neighborhood or whatever. We need to look at ourselves, mm -hmm. and we need to decide within ourselves whether or not we are claiming divine order mm -hmm. and whether our life is in the midst of divine order. And I know some 
and you do too in your counseling ministry, many people whose lives are in horrible, horrible turmoil, turmoil, and yet they are in the midst of absolute and perfect divine order, and they don't get weary, and they don't get tired, and they don't get sick, and they just come back for more and more. And that's what life is about, for us to have the vitality to come back for more and more and more. So we even come to the point of saying, goodness sakes, I don't have enough problems in my life. You know, God, don't you trust me? Bring me some more. Because we need to have that mentality. We need to have the mind, the mind of a mathematician. And we've talked about this before. A mathematician is a person to whom people bring problems. And then he, saw, he or she solves the problem. And then he says, I've solved this problem. Bring me a harder one. Bring me a more difficult one. I'll solve that one. And then I'll show you how to do it. I'll show you how to solve it. And together we'll get better and better at solving problems. And that's what divine order is about. Solving the problems of living our lives and living our daily lives and sharing with others the way in which they can get good at at that too, so that we can all be better at it. <laughs> too often we erroneously think when people are having lots of problems, it means they're not living right. Too often we think that, but that is definitely not true. Absolutely not true. And whether your life is filled with problems or whether it is trouble-free has nothing to do with anything. It just means not that much stronger. <laughs> That's right. And so we can, we can get rid of that. And, <laughs> and the amount of problems we have has nothing to do with our relationship with God or our, our lack thereof. The fact is that the problems that we have are brought to bring us lessons. Yes. And when we learn the lessons, we'll get so good at it that we can just go through the problems and circumstances, and we can always be in the midst of that divine order that we talk about. And when we are, we're serene. When we are, we are an inspiration to others. And we can look about at those persons who are serene, who are an inspiration to us, and we see that they've faced many problems, and some you've related today, those two ladies, but they face them with grace and charm and with uh, acceptance that, yes, this is happening in my life, but as you said, it's not touching me. Absolutely. And the concept and idea of divine order is one that can empower you and strengthen you. And in today's world where people are so stressed and so tired, by changing your way of thinking, you can eliminate the weariness of life and you can strengthen yourself and those around you to be able to deal with the circumstances and situations of life despite appearances in the midst of harmony and divine order always and everywhere. We hope that you've enjoyed the information that we've shared with you and we look forward to seeing you next time. This program is a community outreach of Christ Church. Dr. Mike Costello speaks each Sunday morning at 11 a.m. And Dr. Iris Freelander speaks on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. at the church. On Sunday evenings at 6 p.m., there is a meditation and healing service. Come and join us. You will be warmly welcomed.